Antonio to fade. Go. Good evening, attendees. Now, please welcome our host for this evening, CNN correspondent, Omar Jimenez. What's going on, everyone? I know we're still milling about. We see people we know. Let's just go ahead and find our seats. We got a great program tonight, honoring some incredible journalists. So just find your seats and we'll get ready to go here. You know, I've been to these before. You see everybody you know, and it's just great getting to catch up. And you'll be able to do that around dinner time. But for right now, find your seats. We'll get this going. You know, I told myself I was going to bring a glass out here to clink, clink, clink. I might need it. All right. There we go. All right, everyone, good evening. On behalf of the Committee to Protect Journalists, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the International Press Freedom Awards. Thank you for coming out to support the vital work of this organization. Yes, big round of applause. And a big thank you to Reuters for the videos we'll see shortly and to Google for the cocktail reception you just enjoyed and clearly some of you still enjoying. But in all seriousness, look, it's great to see each other and it is great to come together in times like these to reminisce about some of the happy times. But all of us know that this is incredibly serious work that we do. All of us know the risks that come with the work that we do. And tonight, we honor five journalists who have paid a heavy price for doing what those of us based here in the United States at times take for granted, reporting the news without risking our lives or liberty. We'll celebrate them and hear their stories. By doing so, we pay tribute to the many journalists around the world who have been killed, jailed, forced into exile, or assaulted simply for doing their jobs. Those of you who have been to this dinner before know just how dangerous the world can be for independent journalists. And I know that tonight your thoughts, like mine, are with our colleagues covering the Israel-Hamas war. And I want to focus on that for a moment, specifically on these past few weeks. Since October 7th, at least 42 journalists and media workers have been killed. Since the Committee to Protect Journalists was founded 42 years ago, never have so many journalists been killed in such a short period in a single conflict. Some journalists inside Gaza carried on reporting even after losing a spouse or a child in the bombing. They're exhausted, they're exposed, they lack reliable communications, not to mention in many cases the basic necessities of shelter, food, and water. But still, they persist. Why? Because they know that in this moment, they are the only witnesses able to show the world the brutal reality of this war. We're humbled by their perseverance in the face of such danger and personal loss, and we stand with them. And their efforts, too, while ongoing, should be celebrated and treasured. And while international attention has rightly turned to Israel, Hamas, and Gaza in recent weeks, we can't forget the journalists that continue to face threats all over the world from assassination, imprisonment, and physical attack to spurious lawsuits and online harassment. Last year, the number of journalists behind bars reached a record 363. The space for independent media in so many countries is shrinking. From Afghanistan to Russia and Central America, hundreds of journalists have had to flee abroad for safety. And the assault on the media isn't confined to authoritarian countries or dictatorships. Even in democracies with a vibrant press like India and Mexico, Independent journalists are hounded and harassed, as we will hear later. In too many countries, asking politicians or business tycoons to account for their power or wealth is to put a target on your back. The state of global press freedom may seem dire at times, but it's not hopeless. 
through your financial and moral support, CPJ and its partners are making a stand and making a difference. A journalist is dragged through the courts in India in an attempt to silence her. CPJ is there with legal support to help her keep working. A journalist in Ukraine needs to know how to report safely and keep communication secure. CPJ is there with expert information and support tailored to their needs. A journalist from Iraqi Kurdistan flees to France for safety. CPJ's emergency team has her back. And soon, we'll welcome to this stage a Georgian journalist who spent more than a year in jail, but who is now free thanks to tireless campaigning and advocacy. And yes, there are many other journalists still in prison, including The Wall Street Journal's Evan Gershkovich, whose parents are here tonight. CPJ won't rest until he and so many others are all free. The task of protecting journalists may seem daunting, but let's take a moment to celebrate our successes. In the past 15 years, CPJ has helped in the release of more than a thousand jailed journalists. Every release from a dictator's prison sends a message to those journalists still behind bars that they are not alone and they are not forgotten. They need to know that CPJ and we in this room who support the Committee to Protect Journalists will not stop until they're free. Now, it's my pleasure to invite to the stage the chair of this evening's gala. Please welcome the President and CEO of the New York Times, Meredith Copet Levy. Thank you, Omar. I was warned you're taller than me. Thank you, Omar, for that incredibly kind introduction. It is so nice to be here among so many friends and colleagues and former colleagues, and it is an honor to be in the company of the talented journalists we are celebrating tonight. Nika, Shahina, Maria Teresa, Niaz, and Ferdinand, you exemplify the best of this noble profession. And I want to say to Alberto, you have inspired so many of us with your vision and leadership. In this dark moment for the world, with wars raging and divisions deepening and authoritarianism rising and trust in institutions perilously low, being in a giant room full of people committed to fearless journalism fills me with hope. It fills me with hope because journalists shine light. They pursue the truth and hold power to account. They find the things that stand in the way of a fair and just world. They share what they learn and they empower people to make it better. Now, tonight's room, as you see, is packed. And that is not just because Alan Murray, who is over there somewhere, and I reached out to every single person we have both ever known and asked you to give and to buy tables, which you did so generously. But it is also packed because you understand that journalism is increasingly threatened at precisely the moment when the world needs more of it. As Omar just noted, 42 journalists have died covering the Israel-Hamas war. Record numbers of journalists remain imprisoned. And this is the 232nd day that Evan Gershkovich has been detained in Russia, and that is 232 days that Evan's family, his colleagues at the Wall Street Journal, 
the team at CPJ, and so many people in this room have been working tirelessly to bring him home. Now this room is full of journalists who, just like Evan and tonight's honorees, do their work despite the danger and the difficulty that they know that they'll face. And they, they do it because they know that the world needs it. In fact, the world needs more of it. And that is the biggest lesson I have learned in more than two decades of working on the business side of journalism, simply that the world needs more journalism. And I would add, the world needs more journalism and journalism needs more from the world. It needs the freedom to operate safely and openly without the threat of physical harm and intimidation and harassment. Those freedoms, by the way, are threatened not only in the parts of the world where they have long been at risk, but also in the democracies where until recently we have assumed press freedom to be a settled matter, even sacred. Journalism needs a public that values independence, needs a public that appreciates and seeks out journalism that plays not for a team or for a side, but does its work in pursuit of the truth wherever that truth may lead. And journalism needs a public that can distinguish between quality news and disinformation. And on those last two things that I said, there are things we can no longer take for granted that the public understands and are in as many ways, in many ways, as much our work today as the work of journalism itself. And journalism needs a sustainable business model. This one is personal to me. It needs a business model that can support the expensive work of original reporting and expert editing. It needs a model that can afford to put people on the front lines of war and other difficult places. It needs a model that can fund the many people behind the scenes who make sure that the truth can be pursued in the safest way possible or who work to get the truth out to the widest audience possible. And journalism needs to be part of a business that can grow and attract investment and provide secure jobs and employ talented and committed people, talented and committed people like my many New York Times colleagues who are here in this room who inspire me daily. And finally, I want to say journalism needs all of you. So I want to thank you for the work that you do. I want to thank you really for giving to CPJ. And I want to thank you for standing tall in the fight for more journalism, which is a fight that we are in together. Thank you. From weather and traffic reports to news of political developments, we turn to journalists for the information we need to live our daily lives. Journalists around the world provide the news that is essential for democracy for personal freedom and for safety and stability. Yet their ability to report freely and safely is under attack like never before. So many journalists are paying with their lives. They face exponential risks and they've already paid a heavy toll. Death threats, online harassment and physical attacks are becoming a daily experience of journalists in all countries. We just want people to be safe, to be able to get our readers the information that they need to make informed decisions. They checked my phone and realized that it was Pegasus. I feel myself like I'm naked at the street. These charges were politicized from the start. Facts win. Truth wins. Justice wins. C'est non pour moi d'être là, d'être libre. 
Surtout que je ne m'y attendais pas du tout. Stand with the free press. Stand with journalists whose reporting won't be silenced. Press freedom is your freedom. Press freedom is your freedom. And that's one of the powerful messages from this evening. Our next awardee knows all too well what it can cost to uphold press freedom. Niaz Abdullah is from the northern Kurdish region of Iraq. And after the removal of Saddam Hussein, the region enjoyed greater autonomy, and CPJ worked with journalists and the authorities there to foster a free press. For a while, independent journalists flourished. Niaz was one of them. But the political parties and business interests that run Kurdistan eventually got tired of reporters looking into the use and misuse of power and influence. She was threatened with death, sexual violence, and imprisonment for her pursuit of the truth. But in her own words, I never stopped, I never gave up. The turning point came after she publicly advocated for the release of five colleagues who were sentenced to six years in prison. The threats and pressure became so much that she fled to France. And those of you who attended this dinner last year may remember hearing her story as she was one of its awardees. She couldn't travel to the United States to receive her award, which CPJ has been keeping for the day when she could. That day has arrived. Please welcome Niaz Abdullah. Slaures Lemkati Kalere was taum, Harimi Kurdistanu Iraq, Bunata Dosa Heki Gorebo Rojna Manusan, Ziatr Lesse Sala, Haureani Rojna Manusam Labadinan, Sherwan Sherwaniu, Guhdar Zebari, Legal Karaman Shukri, Rojani Kizur Sahet, Leger Harashau, Ashkanjo Desdreji Sexi Baredakan. Amish Tanya Bohi Ashkra Kardini Peshil Karekani Mafakani Mrovu, Gandalekani Hukmatake Masur Barzani. هشتاش دیان روزنامه نو سی دی که لجیر هر رشوف شردانو بر دوام بانکیش تو چاودی رید کردن لعن دزگ امنی کانو روزنامه نو سان در فنرنو لجیر اشکنجدا دان کدانانیان پیتو مرد کرد اما جگلوی هیچ بکوچه کی روزنامه نو سان بس زای سعی نگین درون چونک بکوچان لپکاتی خودی دسالاتن زوری که روزنامه نو سان لجیر فشاردن آشار کرین نشتمانی خوشایستی خوان جبهالین بلام هشت بر دوامی نو، ارکو بر پرسیارتی جور مال استو دایبو، تیکوشان و برگری کردن لعازدی را در برین. لقل پاشکشی هر رج نامنو سیدا، لجیر هر رشا، چندین راستی وند بنو، دنگی خلقی کیستم لکرای و پرایس خراو نگن. باید به بدر فدان، با کاری آزادی رج نامنو سان و آزادی را در برین، هیچ شنازیت، با هیچ حکمت نامنی تا. لیرا و زور سپاسی تایبته سی پی جی دکم. با ام خلاصه بنرخو پر بهایا. CPJ بدرجای سالانی را بر دو تا است. لقل ام و سدان رجنامه نوز وسطا و لپیناو پرستنی سلامتی منو بر دوامی من. هر وحد دمید لذلم و سپاسی ها و رکان مو بته بد خزانه کم کم. با اول لهمو رج سخت و مترسی در رکان دا ببو نسر چاوی و روهز بام. با من شنازی کجی ایم. لکوتای قزکانم دا. ام خلاصه پیشکش دکم به چهار سیمبل آزادی خوازی کردستان. آوانش بریتین لا، زندانیانی بادینان، جینا محسا امینی، صلاح الدین دمیرتاش، مظلوم عبدی، جنجیان آزادی. Thank you, Nias. We now come to that part of the program where we meet this year's honorees. To present the first award, we welcome Almar Latour, Chief Executive Officer of Dow Jones and publisher of the Wall Street Journal. Almar and his colleagues at the journal are well aware of the dangers faced by journalists. They're currently battling for the release of their imprisoned Moscow correspondent, Evan Gershkovich. Friends, please welcome Almar Latour.
Thank you, Omar. I know the fight for Evan's release uh, means a great deal to everyone in this room. Uh, as we heard, uh, Evan has now been wrongfully detained for almost eight months. And as everyone here is keenly aware, every day is a day too long. Thank you, Committee to Protect Journalists, and thank you, everyone, for your continued support. For Evan himself, of course, for all his colleagues at the Wall Street Journal and his parents and family. In contrast to Russia, neighboring Georgia looked at one point as if it might embrace press freedom. Those hopes were dashed with the imprisonment last year of broadcast journalist Nika Varamia. Fortunately, thanks to CPJ and a host of other press freedom organizations, family and colleagues, Nika was pardoned in June this year. Hope of something unbelievable and unusual is not the best ally in the prison. You just have to hope that your cause will, will prevail, but for survival, you need to leave your hope to be released, you know, and leave this hope aside. Nika is one of the most recognizable faces in Georgia. He served as a government minister in the government of uh, then-President Mikhail Saakashvili. Nika became a journalist working for Rustavi 2, which was then one of the biggest opposition channels. And then he founded his own uh, TV channel called Mtavari Arhi. Nika has been very critical of the authorities. When the first charges were brought against him, uh, it was clear that the authorities are trying to retaliate against his reporting and to silence him. No one believed that I will be imprisoned at the end of the day, including my wife, Sophia. He served Georgia was first journalist imprisoned by political reasons. Still fight. Uh... His wife, uh, Sofia Liloashvili, worked very closely with the lawyers as well as with international organizations. We uh, went to the prison and spoke to the media calling on the Georgian authorities to release him. There are no legal grounds for holding him criminally liable. We wrote to the Georgian president uh, asking her to use her power and authority uh, and grant a uh, presidential pardon. And when it happened, I immediately called Sophia. We were very happy. We cried together. We're in a framework where it's possible to imprison journalists or anyone other for political reasons. There is no chance to have free society. Giko is here because it's a serious risk to have him uh, in Georgia. My son, he is like me, and he is not allowed to visit Georgia. I, I don't want him to be the part of my fight. I mean, in this sense, they are. The whole my family is somehow sacrificed uh, to this cause. Unfortunately, presidential pardon is not a sign that the press freedom environment is improving. I would say it's rather an exception, uh, a good surprise, because right now Georgia is at the crossroad. Just fight. Just fight is a recipe how to get through. Just fight. I think that freedom of speech is a quintessence of freedom and freedom is quintessence of happiness. And you can't pursue happiness without being free. And now, in the spirit of hope and resilience that all families and colleagues of imprisoned journalists must hold dear, it gives me great pleasure 
to present the 2023 International Press Freedom Award to Nika Kvaramia. a journalist so I know what is prompters about that's just technique so in any, in any minute it can be shut down so I, I just need some of my writings as well hello to everyone I'm very happy to be here as a journalist who spent 400 days in jail for my work in Georgia and especially after Almar presented me. I have to start and I must start and I will start with solidarity with Evan Gershkovich and his incredible family which is here. I hope he will be released very soon and we will have him here free and safe. Evan, we we'll stand with you. So my congratulations to my fellow awardees, very decent people, very kind, the high professionals making world better. I love you guys. Thank you very much for being the kindest persons, professionals, and making world better, as I said. So I'm deeply honored to address you tonight. My special gratitude goes to Committee to Protect Journalists for this award, for standing with me, and especially for standing with my family. My love goes to my wife, Sophia, who is shining here. Uh, and my, I love you. And my children, the eldest one is here, Giko. And other two are in Tbilisi, Georgia. I was born in the Soviet Union in 1976. My parents were so-called intelligentsia, and they were reading a, lot, reading a lot. At the time, we had the you know, strange books, hand copied with bindings, barely holdings, holding together and covers strangely absent. Among others, one book held a special place and looked like very special. It was called Gospel of John and it began with these words. In the beginning was a word and the word was with God, and the word was God. So once in the early 80s, uh, when the Soviet basketball team lost, as usual, to the American team, <laughs> my father found me crying about it. So he told me that all of a sudden, it was very awkward then to me, that I should be happy because Soviets should always lose. <laughs> so later, I learned that my journalist and writing father was imprisoned for two years in 1969 for being dissident, 
for his anti-Soviet statements and for writing and printing illegal underground newsletters. I learned that the truth was being told by the radio, by Voice of America, not my Soviet TV. And that music played there was called jazz, and guys singing there were, were Beatles, the Beatles. When the Soviet Union collapsed, so I thought that, you know, here it is, freedom, the fresh air. I was 14 or 15 years old, so, but it turned out that the road to the freedom, to freedom was just beginning. After 30 years of Georgia's independence, it was I who became a dissident, imprisoned for my words. I found myself in cell 212 in Rostavi prison in Georgia, serving my term and making myself the promise to do everything in power, in my power, to ensure that my children would never be confined in a cell for expressing their thoughts and their words, because the word is God. The word is freedom, so freedom is God and God is freedom. In the spirit of Kafka's words, someone must watch, someone must be there, I steadfastly refuse to choose between my homeland and between my freedom, opting for both my homeland and my freedom, for both together. Now I am determined to keep my promise and to carry on with my fight. I profoundly believe that we must not just endure, we will prevail. We must and we will prevail. So I will watch. I will be there in my sweet Georgia, always on my mind. <laughs> so freedom to all political prisoners, Kaumar Josa Kartuelos, Slava Ukraini, peace to Israel and all the peaceful and free people of that region. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nika. Georgia is also on my mind, but I guess a different one. <laughs> Our next presenter is an award-winning writer, filmmaker, and medical doctor, and CEO of the Africa Center. As the founder of Ventures Africa magazine, he's also in the journalist family himself. Please welcome Uzodinma Iwela. Being an investigative journalist in many African countries is a constant struggle to access information that should be available to the public. Ferdinand Aite and his colleagues tried to inform their fellow citizens in the tiny West African nation of Togo. In doing so, he exposed uncomfortable truths, and his efforts have cost him dearly. Ce n'est pas de gaieté de cœur qu'on abandonne sa, sa famille et ses enfants pour se retrouver euh, euh, ici. 
je n'avais plus de vie, et je n'avais plus d'amis, je, 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 je ne sortais plus, je vivais comme un moine parce que j'avais peur de tout et, et de rien. Je suis journaliste, je suis directeur de publication du biais hebdomadaire d'investigation l'alternative qui euh, travaillons hein, euh, à fouiller un peu les poubelles si je peux le dire ainsi euh, pour sortir hein, sur la place publique euh, tout ce qui est caché à l'opinion et il s'est fait que euh, il y a deux ans euh, au cours d'une de, de ces émissions euh, nous avons eu à, à critiquer certains ministres du gouvernement togolais qui euh, qui sont à la fois euh, qui sont des ministres au gouvernement, mais dans la vie civile sont des, des, des religieux, des pasteurs. Ce qui porte énormément atteinte euh, au principe de la laïcité, dans, euh, particulièrement le 11 euh, décembre 2021. J'étais à la rédaction avec toute mon équipe quand la police a débarqué euh, pour m'étendre une convocation et, et de les suivre. Over the years, Ferdinand's faced legal harassment, a defamation case, and he's faced the threat of surveillance. And then the prosecution in 2021 that then was reinvigorated earlier this year, just days after they fled the country, a court in Togo delivered a guilty verdict against them in which they were sentenced to three years in prison. Et voilà mon rédacteur en chef qui est aussi aujourd'hui condamné à trois ans de prison, qui a aussi quitté le pays en abandonnant femme et enfant. Et, et, et tout est fait pour, 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 pour faire disparaître la presse libre et indépendante au Togo, ce qui est vraiment une très grande inquiétude pour nous parce que euh, la quête de cette liberté d'expression a été un long parcours pour les Togolais. The reporters like Ferdinand, who are focusing on the issues that matter most to the Togolese, are living examples of hope for press freedom in the country. CPJ is there reporting on those issues, supporting them in whatever way we can, calling authorities to make them know that the world is watching what is happening to the press in the country. And now in exile, we're supporting Ferdinand and the editor-in-chief of L'Alternative. They are trying to reconstitute their newspaper in exile. They are trying to continue to fight for freedom in Togo, and CPJ will continue to stand with them Ma plus grande peur, c'est que, euh, avec cette méthode de mort lente, le régime au, au Togo arrive à prendre le dessus sur euh, la presse indépendante. Et ça, c'est vraiment ma, ma plus grande crainte. S'il n'y a plus de presse indépendante, s'il n'y a plus de journal d'investigation, alors euh, l'obscurité va s'emparer du pays. La motivation, c'est l'amour qu'on a pour le pays. for his courage and determination to pursue the truth no matter the cost. I am honored to present the 2023 International Press Freedom Award to Ferdinand Aite. Distingués invités, mesdames, messieurs, chers confrères, lorsque tu viens d'un pays comme le mien, facilement classé parmi ceux qui peuvent susciter peu d'intérêt sur le plan international, tu es toujours ému de te retrouver à des tribunes pareilles. Évidemment ému par le prestige d'y être, mais surtout par le fait que tu prends conscience que ta vie, ta sécurité, celle d'autres confrères de ton pays et des localités similaires sont reconnues et portées au même niveau que celles des journalistes d'ailleurs. C'est pour cela que je serai toujours reconnaissant au Comité pour la protection des journalistes de tout le soutien qu'ils apportent aux journalistes partout dans le monde, y compris dans des endroits qui pourraient paraître lointains isolés, désespérés, 
susceptibles d'être facilement oubliés ou négligés. Venant d'un pays, venant du Togo, un pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest, où sévit la plus vieille dictature en Afrique, je suis témoin des fruits de l'engagement de CPJ pour une presse libre à travers le monde. Ce travail ne doit nullement s'arrêter. Messieurs, dames, ma conviction est qu'on ne devrait laisser nulle part sur cette terre où prospèrent des îlots de nos droits, de dictature, parce qu'ils seraient loin de nous. Comme une pandémie ou un cancer, cela finit par se répandre et contaminer d'autres localités et régions. Ayant inauguré les coups d'État en Afrique dès 1963, trois ans après son indépendance, le pouvoir au Togo est devenu aujourd'hui l'allié principal des régimes militaires liberticides qui foisonnent désormais en Afrique. Le régime transforme le pays en un bastion régional des propagandistes géopolitiques et des manipulations de masse avec des discours dits panafricains pendant qu'il étouffe toute divergence et les médias indépendants sur son territoire. Je voudrais également envoyer un message de solidarité à tous les journalistes indépendants du Togo qui travaillent dans des conditions assez difficiles. Je pense en ce moment aux deux confrères, Loïc Lawson et Anani Sosu, actuellement en détention. Ils ont été mis en prison cette semaine. Qu'ils reçoivent ici mon soutien. Depuis cette tribune, je voudrais avoir une pensée particulière pour les membres de ma rédaction. Ils sont aujourd'hui sans travail. Parce que les deux premiers responsables, le rédacteur en chef et moi-même le directeur, nous sommes contraints en exil avec pour conséquence la suspension de nos parutions. D'ici, je voudrais saluer particulièrement la mémoire d'un confrère, frère et co-détenu, Joël Ega. Lui et moi avons été injustement arrêtés, jetés en prison en 2021, sous le fallacieux prétexte de trage à des autorités. Ces dernières ont mobilisé l'appareil judiciaire pour nous anéantir. Après des semaines passées avec moi en détention, Joël Ega est brusquement décédé le 9 mars 2022 dans des conditions assez troubles. Je m'incline ici devant sa mémoire et je renouvelle mes pensées à sa famille. Je pense à tous les journalistes africains actuellement sous menace, particulièrement ceux des pays du Sahel, Mali, Burkina, Niger, qui sont constamment sous la menace des dirigeants, mais aussi des groupes autoproclamés qui s'en prennent tout à toute voix qui ne reprend pas le narratif des régimes militaires. Comment oublier notre confrère Stanis Boujakera Tiamala privés de liberté depuis plusieurs semaines en République démocratique du Congo. Eux tous ont besoin de notre soutien dans une région où la situation sécuritaire se dégrade continuellement. Je ne peux finir sans avoir une pensée profonde pour tous les journalistes tués depuis le 7 octobre au Moyen-Orient. Enfin, permettez-moi d'avoir une pensée pour mon épouse et mes trois enfants qui sont encore au pays et qui, eux, continuent de faire l'objet de harcèlement quotidien. Je pense fortement à eux. Toutes ces choses que nous subissons sont destinées à nous faire baisser les bras. Non, nous ne devons pas abandonner et nous n'abandonnerons pas. Je vous remercie.
Thank you, Ferdinand. Now we've gotten to the part of the program where we get to eat. So if you haven't already, enjoy, mingle, have dinner. We're going to take a break for 45 minutes, and we'll see you back soon.
Kafka. And now, please welcome back to the stage, Omar Jimenez. Two roaring round of applause. Wow, everybody must be engaged. I know we're all enjoying our dinner right now, but I want to get back to the program. We've got a lot more honorees tonight, a lot more stories to tell, reminders of the work that we do and the risks that come with them. So finish up those bites of fish that I know we're all enjoying. Take those sips, and we're going to continue the program right now. I hope you all enjoyed the dinner. We're able to catch up with some old friends, maybe make some new ones. This is the 33rd CPJ Annual Awards Gala, and only the second for its new leader. And if you don't know her already, she is an incredible force and a main reason why CPJ is able to do the work that it does. When you hear the stories of these honorees and you see the influence that CPJ has had on not just the work that they do, but their ability to do their jobs, this next person is very central in those efforts. So please welcome CPJ President Jody Ginsburg. What a lot of you there are. Um, friends, it is a joy and a privilege to be with you again this evening, honoring the journalists who bring us the news despite huge personal risks. The fact that all five of this year's awardees and one f former awardee could join us in person is in and of itself incredibly special. Because sadly, in an era of record levels of journalist imprisonment and rapidly rising exile, it's all too rare. So tonight is a night when we celebrate. We celebrate those with us in the room and those who cannot be with us. And so while tonight is rightly a time of celebration, it is also a time of mourning. We mourn the loss of colleagues killed for their work. Colleagues like Martinez Zogo, tortured and murdered in Cameroon in January of this year. Colleagues like Dumeski Kersan, shot dead in Haiti. Colleagues like Golam Rabani Nadim, ambushed and beaten to death by a gang in Bangladesh. And we mourn the loss of all those journalists killed during the current Israel-Gaza war. Colleagues like Issam Abdallah, a 37-year-old visual journalist with Reuters, whose colleagues are here today. We also mourn alongside those whose families have been killed, including Al Jazeera's Gaza City bureau chief, Wael Al Dahdu, and who, like Wael, humble us by continuing to work despite the most impossible of circumstances, because they, like us, believe press freedom is essential for all our freedoms. <laughs> Journalists are civilians. We are not targets, we are not combatants. Our pens and our cameras are not weapons of war, but tools of justice. And above all, we are human beings. Earlier this year, CPJ's office here in New York was alive with events and meetings as we celebrated World Press Freedom Day in New York. On one particular day, we had a group of Uzbek bloggers in one room, while a group of media lawyers, some of whom are here today, met in another. And in that mix, I found myself observing Sebastian Lai and Jose Zamora sharing a quiet, private moment to talk about their fathers, 
Jimmy Lai, and Jose Ruben Zamora, media owners currently jailed in Hong Kong and Guatemala, respectively. And it occurred to me watching this moment that this, that moment, is what makes CPJ special, that we see journalists first and foremost as people, as fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, sisters, brothers, colleagues, and friends. The individual and the community of which they are part is woven into the very fabric of what we do at the Committee to Protect Journalists. Over the past year, the CPJ team, now 75 people working across the globe from Beirut to Bangkok, from New York to Nairobi, has worked tirelessly, documenting threats to journalists, advocating on their behalf, and providing record levels of practical assistance from digital safety advice to emergency relocation grants. The team cannot all be here tonight, but I'd like to recognize the team by asking those that are in the room to stand. Can we get the house lights out? They are CPJ, and I am immensely proud to stand alongside them. You too, all of you in this room, are also CPJ. You ensure that we continue to do this vital work. It has never been more needed. Thank you. I get to switch microphones now and walk about. You know what's coming. Our core mission is to protect journalists everywhere who are at risk. That takes money. Helping just one journalist can take months of work, painstaking research, documentation, travel, emergency funds for evacuation, cost of living, medical, or legal support. Our dedicated staff, whom you see, saw just now and who voiced the intro video also for you, already make every cent of every dollar that you give count. But as you've already heard tonight, and as we will hear later, demand from at-risk journalists is growing, and CPJ has to grow to meet that challenge. And that's why you are here at this fundraiser tonight. Many of you have bought tables or tickets, and we thank you for that. Some of you are here as guests. No matter how you came, you are all here because you support a free, free press. So, we need your help to make this fundraiser a record success. We are in touching distance of a record amount raised at our IPFA dinner. And since we've been going for 33 years, that's pretty impressive. We're being helped this evening by the Knight Foundation, which is generously offering a dollar for dollar match. So, every dollar we raise in the next few minutes, the Knight Foundation will match up to a limit of a quarter of a million dollars. That means any money you give now is worth double to CPJ. It says on my prompter that there's no prompter for the rest, which means I can go totally off script, which will really probably terrify my colleagues. Um, so this is the way it's going to work. This is a reverse auction, and we start by asking people in the room uh, whether they'll give a significant amount of money. If you don't want to raise your hand because you're too embarrassed by the enormous amount of money that you're going to pledge, you can text it to CPJ at 41444 to show your support. There are also car QR codes on your table. But let's give it a go. So, 
Is there anyone in the room who would like to pledge to CPJ to support all of the fantastic work that we do and help all of those journalists whom we've heard tonight a hundred thousand dollars? Yes! I don't have my glasses on, so you're going to have to wave a lot, um, which might mean that some of the waiting staff may also end up pledging to CPJ. Um, thank you, Miles Taylor, for your generous $100,000 gift to CPJ. Which, thanks to the Knight Foundation, is worth $200,000. So we're on our way to a record amount. Is there anyone else who would like to pledge a hundred thousand. Just happened, in, find it in your pocket. Okay, let's try 50,000. Remember, anything you give this evening is doubled by the Knight Foundation and goes to support all of the work CPJ does assisting journalists. Is that someone over there? No, that's not someone waving. Okay, $25,000. Come on, $25,000. It can help journalists who've been forced into exile and give them a new home so that they can carry on reporting. $25,000 over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else for $25,000? Your support helps us with legal fees for journalists. As you will hear tonight, so many of our journalists face increased legal threats to do their work. What about $10,000? There must be some people in this room. Some people of you look like you're wearing $10,000, so you must be able to do $10,000 for CPJ. If you have someone on your table who's putting their hand up for $10,000, please applaud loudly. Yes, this table here. Is there anyone else on your table who would like to do the same thing? 10,000, come on people. It's my event so I can shut all the doors unless, unless people start giving money. Anyone else who can do $10,000 to help CPJ? And remember, if you can't or you're too embarrassed to tell us how much money you're going to give, you can text it to 41444 to show your support. Okay, 5,000. 5,000. Remember, everything that you give is doubled and we're trying to make a record. 5,000. Thank you. 5,000. Thank you. Anyone else? 5,000. Thank you. 5,000, thank you. Any money you give to CPJ gets doubled tonight and we're trying to make a record amount of money. Last call for 5,000. Okay, 1,000. Can anyone pledge 1,000? Remember your 1,000 is actually 2,000, thank you. 2,000, essentially. 1,000, thank you. There's people waving over there. I don't know if you're waving to give money, but you've put your hand up, so you are now. Here, thank you, 1,000, thank you. Over there, thank you, 1,000. This is good, come on, keep going. 1,000, thank you. There, there's 1,000, thank you. These heels are really uncomfortable, so the faster you do this, the quicker I can get off. 1,000 here, thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? 1,000, come on. 1,000 here, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. All right, last call for $1,000. All right, 
We will, a thousand dollars here, thank you. Thank you. So let me remind you, if you haven't put your hand up, please text CPJ to 4144 and pledge something today, something now, to support journalists. It doesn't matter how much you give, it just matters that you give something. CPJ is really grateful for whatever amount that you can give. We will let you know at the end of the evening how we did. And now I will hand back to Omar for the rest of the program. Thank you. All right. One of you who donated 25,000, you still owe me $10, so I don't know how I don't know how that happened, but you still, I'm gonna find you. Look everyone, we're gonna keep the program moving here with our next two presenters. A lot of incredible stories to tell here tonight. Our next two presenters won a Pulitzer Prize for their fearless reporting of abuse and sexual misconduct by Harvey Weinstein. They're both in their own right dogged investigative reporters with impressive portfolios. You're gonna to wanna to hear what they have to say as they announce tonight's next honorees. Please welcome Jody Cantor and Megan Tui. India is hailed. India is hailed as the world's largest democracy. It has tens of thousands of journalists and a wide array of news outlets. But that does not mean that journalists are protected or free to report on everything they discover. Freedom of expression, as we will see, can come at great personal cost. Everything began when now uh, when I was working with Tehelka as the Kerala correspondent, I traveled to Karnataka for doing a story on a bogus charge sheet uh, cooked up by the police against a Muslim scholar. I am KK Shahina. I work with Outlook magazine as senior editor. China's case is definitely first of its kind because she was one of the first journalists in India to be charged under UAPA, the Unlawful Prevention Activities Act, which is an anti-terror law in India. Uh, she was uh, accused by the police of herself doctoring evidence and interfering in a police investigation. My son was just four years old that time and we were running from one place to the other for the first seven months of uh, me being framed, I was not in a position to stay at home because there is a chance of being arrested. And after that, there was this very, very long process of interrogation. Only a person who went through it can understand what exactly uh, an interrogation is. They did everything except touching your body. It happened in 2010 and I have been traveling to Udagu for the case for the last 13 years. Uh, I have to go once in every month. China's court case has been so drawn out primarily because of the judicial process in India, which usually takes a lot of time. The case has not even seen the trial. Some of the Indian states have been using various sections of security laws to target journalists. Out of the six journalists who are currently in prison, five of them have been targeted under UAPA. Journalists are applying a lot of self censorship upon them. Maybe people are afraid, of course, and in my case, uh, I can't say that I'm afraid because I think that the worst has already happened to me. We have supported China from the very onset by uh, offering a legal aid. Uh, we've also uh, helped China with her mental health uh, because, you know, long drawn fights like this has, takes a huge emotional and mental toll. It's, it's tough, actually, it's tough. We are living with the, um, what you can say, a target on your back. She's born into a Muslim family. Though she does not just identify as a Muslim, she identifies as somebody who comes from the peripheries of the society. We do see that a major portion of journalists who are being targeted are from a certain religious community. 
organizations like cpj provide lot of courage to people they um, enable journalists uh, to move on and they enable to journalists to you know to keep their uh, the rigor of their work so i must say that life has changed of course but not only in a bad way but also there are a lot of positive things happen to me as a journalist i grew the circumstances uh, which which were forced upon me due to this case actually helped me to to enlarge my canvas and to to strengthen me as a journalist It's our great pleasure to present the 2023 International Press Freedom Award to Shania KK. എല്ലാവർക്കും നമസ്കാരം ദാറ്റ്സ് ദ വേ ഓഫ് ഗ്രീറ്റിംഗ് ഇൻ മൈ മദർ ടങ് മലയാളം ഐ ലിവ് ഇൻ കേരള ഇൻ ഇന്ത്യ ആസ് യു ഹാവ് സീൻ ഇൻ ദാറ്റ് വീഡിയോ ടുഡേ ഇസ് ദ തേർട്ടീൻത്ത് ആനിവേഴ്സറി ഓഫ് ദ ഐ മീൻ ലൈക്ക് മൈ ലൈഫ് ടേൺ അപ് സൈഡ് ഡൗൺ ആൻഡ് ഐ എം ഓണേഡ് ആൻഡ് ഹംബിൾ ടു റിസീവ് CPJ's International Press Freedom Award. On this day, 13 years ago, I was in the Kudagu region of uh, South India in the state of Karnataka, which is renowned for its tea, coffee and ginger plantations. I was working for Tehilka, as you have seen in that video, which was a news magazine. and my assignment was to cover a deadly bomb blast in bangalore in 2008 during my investigation i interviewed key witnesses who had testified against a muslim cleric to my dismay i discovered that their testimonies were fabricated tehelka published the story titled why is this man still in prison but instead of acting to address the flaws exposed by my reporting the local state police turned against me i have been entangled in this legal battle ever since i am currently out on bail pending trial as time went on i made a conscious effort to derive more from my courtroom experiences i met many people who had unusual encounters with the legal system with a significant number of them being victims of fabricated cases this resulted in a series of articles that illuminated the challenges endured by the marginalized population in the state of karnataka in india as i sought to understand legal abuses i also pursued a law degree ultimately i earned it in 2016 from now onwards i can any time start practicing as a lawyer but still i choose and i prefer journalism when i was charged i was one of the first journalists to face this oppressive anti terror law unlawful activities prevention act but today 15 journalists across india bear the weight of this act with some in jail and others out on bail journalism has always been my primary passion driven by a deep desire to understand 
how politics and power impact people's lives. 26 years ago, I embarked on my career as a television journalist in Singapore at a time when private broadcasting was not permitted in India. Today, my determination to be in the field led me to explore diverse regions of India, shedding light on the struggles of the un underprivileged against the prevailing power structures. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to CPJ for standing by me since the moment my legal ordeal began. I want to recognize Kunal Majumdar, CPJ's India representative. <laughs> Kunal, your considerate support has meant a lot to me, and I thank you for it. I also want to express my profound appreciation to my friends and family who have unwaveringly supported me through the most trying period of my life. I can't forget to mention my partner Rajiv and my son Anpu, they are here. <laughs> Their lives have been turned upside down due to this case. Anpu was, who is here tonight, was a tiny four-year-old when the case was slapped on me. We had to go on the run to dodge arrest while we waited for bail. It took around eight months for me to get bail. It really hit him the hardest. He had to say goodbye to his little buddies and the cool schooling we had dreamt of for him. After November 2010, our lives took a sharp turn for the worst, and we are still in the thick of this battle, far from seeing the end. I dedicate this award to all my fellow journalists in India who are targeted for their work and journalism. And I extend my solidarity to all the victims of war, whether it be in Ukraine or in Palestine. Thank you all. Thank you. Now, our next presenter knows all too well how the families and loved ones of imprisoned journalists suffer. His father is one of Guatemala's most prominent journalists, Jose Ruben Zamora, who has been held unjustly in solitary confinement for more than a year. Please welcome Jose Carlos Zamora. Thank you, Omar. As you noted, press freedom is under attack in my home country, as it is in much of Central America. Further north, in Mexico, journalists, especially those outside of the capital of Mexico City, are at risk if they report on corrupt officials and organized crime. Violence and intimidation has turned whole swaths of, con of the country into news deserts, where only a handful of brave journalists dare to speak out. Reiteramos nuestra exigencia de justicia. Que no haya impunidad. Para que cada uno de los colegas que han caído puedan descansar en paz. Te enfrentas a muchísimos obstáculos, eh, mucho bloqueo informativo, eh, obstrucciones, persecución, a violencias institucionales. Yo he sido despedida de varios medios eh, a petición del gobierno del Estado después de que yo me, me he negado sistemáticamente eh, a recibir eh, pagos extralegales directos de ellos. 
Soy María Teresa Montaño Delgado, soy periodista independiente. Mexico is uh, one of the deadliest countries in the world for journalists. There's a lot of forced displacement of reporters, especially internally. Uh, a lot of reporters have to leave their states. There's also a very large number of journalists who feel like they cannot be safe anywhere in the country anymore. Maria Teresa Montaño is one of the very few journalists in Mexico who, on the regional level, is actively investigating corruption uh, within the ranks of state authorities. Todavía siempre fueron también muchas como burlas, humillaciones, groserías. Eh, entraron a la casa y solo se llevaron un archivo, una caja de archivo, el contenido de la caja de archivo. Todos los papeles eso, se los llevaron. Yo tenía mucho miedo, yo estaba destruida. Mi vida cambió por completo. Yo tuve que salir del país eh, en dos ocasiones. Y bueno, ya estando en estos viajes, yo retomé mi investigación porque justo la investigación que se publicó con apoyo de The Guardian y Forbidden Stories fue este, la que me robaron. Desde muy pequeño siempre le hemos visto trabajar arduamente para buscar la verdad entre todo, en cambiar pues, la forma en la que vive el país, el Estado, en cambiar pues el sistema desde la verdad y pues me llena de mucho orgullo. Este ha sido muy difícil. Si no fuera por las organizaciones internacionales yo no tendría ni para comer. Pero este al mismo tiempo eh, He recibido mucha solidaridad de periodistas de afuera porque es verdad ese dicho de que nadie es profeta en su tierra. We communicated her case with the federal mechanism for uh, the protection of journalists and ever since we've been trying to promote her work and been trying to pressure the authorities into continuing their protective measures because unfortunately in Mexico without pressure from public opinion, without pressure from journalists and without pressure from civil society organizations like uh, CPJ, uh, authorities are very rarely persuaded or motivated uh, to provide adequate protection for reporters poner en el centro a la gente su derecho a saber, su derecho a informar qué es lo que realmente está pasando con su gobierno, quiénes son, qué están haciendo. Eh, por eso, eso es lo que me mueve. It is my great pleasure to present the 2023 International Press Freedom Award to Maria Teresa Montaño. Gracias. Vengo del centro de México, donde he hecho periodismo durante más de 30 años, en un lugar con uno de los regímenes más corruptos del planeta, probablemente, eh, que ha estado en el poder durante más de 90 años y donde, a pesar de la alternancia, la justicia se sigue vendiendo, la pobreza se criminaliza se fabrican culpables, las élites políticas y empresariales desvían los recursos públicos y eh, desvían los recursos públicos y donde la prensa independiente es algo fuera de lo normal. Narrar la corrupción del Estado de México me ha implicado enfrentar demandas, despidos injustificados, espionaje, linchamiento digital acosos gubernamentales para intentar acallarme o comprarme, con costos para mí y mi familia. Mi familia era modesta, mi padre electricista, Humberto, mi madre ama de casa, María del Socorro. Estudié periodismo asistiendo a clases solo los fines de semana y leyendo en los libros. 
Sin embargo, aprendí que el periodismo debe de estar del lado de la gente, como un servicio social que debe contribuir a la democracia y al pueblo. No puedo entender el periodismo de otra forma. Soy una anomalía del sistema porque sobreviví a la violencia contra periodistas en México, donde prevalece el acoso, el hostigamiento y linchamiento mediático y digital contra periodistas que incomodan al poder y la narcopolítica. También batallo por el aislamiento por coacción gubernamental, la discriminación y los bloqueos informativos. Además, por ser mujer periodista de investigación y meter las narices en los negocios privados que se hacen desde el poder público. En 2021 me secuestraron, prometieron volver por, por mí a matarme, a mí y a mi hijo, Mientras estuve retenida sin poder moverme y con la cara cubierta, le di gracias a Dios por la vida que me ha dado. Y le pedí que cuidara a mis hijos y también a mis hermanos. Pensé que eran los últimos minutos de mi vida. El jefe de los secuestradores al final me soltó porque dijo que ya estaba cansado. Al final ni siquiera yo podía creerlo. En el país de las desapariciones y la impunidad más absoluta, yo seguía viva. Por eso creo que soy una desviación del sistema, una grieta en el muro, exactamente igual como he hecho periodismo estos 30 años, golpeando contra el muro y buscando y haciendo grietas. Quiero dedicar este premio a las y los periodistas en México, que desde su aislamiento a los periodistas locales que siguen golpeando duro contra esos muros de autoritarismo, corrupción, injusticias e impunidad. A esos y esas periodistas libres que a punta de teclazos tiran muros. Dedico este premio a la libertad de expresión, a esos y esas periodistas que no se venden y que están al lado correcto en momentos cruciales. Quiero dedicar de manera especial este premio a Nina Lacani, Martin Hudson de The Guardian y a Forbidden Stories por no soltarme cuando todo parecía tambalear. Agradezco a mi equipo de The Observer Mex, donde construimos un periodismo que se sale de los estándares locales con convicción, muchas carencias, pero dignos y libres. Gracias también infinitas a CPJ y a todas las organizaciones que han contribuido a mi seguridad en los últimos años y han hecho posible que hoy esté aquí, a pesar de que sobre mi cabeza pesa aún una amenaza de muerte y no se ha resuelto mi secuestro. Quiero además manifestar mi solidaridad más absoluta a José Rubén Zamora y hacemos voto por su libertad. Y a las familias de los periodistas asesinados en el conflicto de Medio Oriente, oramos para que se les brinde protección y a todos los periodistas que en condiciones difíciles realizan su trabajo en aquella regi región. Gracias infinitas a todos por estar aquí. Gracias. Thank you, Maria. Each year, CPJ gives an award in honor of the late U.S. journalist and long-serving CPJ board member Gwen Eiffel. It's given to an individual who's shown extraordinary and sustained achievement in the cause of press freedom. Here to present that award is someone who himself is a staunch defender of a free press. Please welcome the president of the Ford Foundation and CPJ board member, Darren Walker. Good evening. I am so delighted on this occasion to present my friend, Alberto Ibarguen with the Gwen Eiffel Press Freedom Award. For those of us who knew Gwen Eiffel, she was beloved, 
adored, admired. Gwen's belief in America was unwavering and unyielding. She was passionate about journalism. She was passionate about diversity. She believed that for America to be a flourishing democracy, we needed to have a vibrant community of journalists and media system. So it is most fitting that on this occasion, my friend Alberto Barguin is the recipient of the Gwen Eiffel Press Freedom Award because Alberto believes in democracy, in America, in diversity, in journalism, and in media. And he has demonstrated that consistently, courageously, with passion. Alberto is a person, if you read the bio, you don't see what's behind the curtain. I'll give you some insights. There's an initiative that many of you are aware of called Press Forward, which has as its objective to raise a billion dollars to help ensure that our nation has a robust local media ecosystem, that we save journalism in small towns, in smaller markets, and in some larger markets. Alberto was the person, along with John Palfrey, who made this initiative happen. And while many other foundations, including my own, were credited, we actually had very little to do with this initiative, if I'm to be candid and honest, which we foundation presidents have a hard time doing sometimes. Alberto also stepped into the breach in a moment for another person we all know who, like Gwen, is a very, very hard-charging, opinionated, brilliant journalist, Nicole Hannah-Jones. When Nicole found herself in a most, <laughs> in a most regrettable circumstance, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And it was Alberto who suggested to Nicole that a solution for her, because she was indeed to be awarded the night chair in journalism at Chapel Hill, Alberto suggested a solution. Why not move the night chair from Chapel Hill to a historically black college. Nicole, who, Nicole, whose dream it was, was to actually establish both a chair and a new program at Howard University, was able to have her vision realized in large part because Alberto was a first mover. And it is true, once again, that some other foundations and some other foundation presidents received a lot of credit in the media. But it was one Alberto Ibarguen who made that possible. And finally, tonight, Alberto once again and the Knight Foundation stepped forward to, for the 15th year, offer a match for the funds that we raise tonight. So I think it is fitting that my friend, Alberto Ibarguen, is the recipient of the Gwyn Eiffel Press Freedom Award for 2023. Please join me in acknowledging, recognizing, and showing some love to one Alberto Ibargoen.
thank you. <clears throat> thank you very, very much, Darren. And congratulations to all of you who have made it through three hours or four hours of program, and you're still standing. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Meredith, Jacob, and Jody. It is, a, it is an extraordinary night when a friend presents you with an award named after another friend from an organization you've supported for 40 years and all in the presence of your granddaughters who are here. <laughs> so I should probably stop there, but I really do need to say that Tonight's award, named for Gwen, is deeply meaningful to me. She was a terrific reporter, as you know. She was a great friend to me and a loyal partner to CPJ and to the Knight Foundation. I became involved with the Committee to Protect Journalists in its earliest days when Kati Martin was the chair. I was at New York Newsday. Kati Martin was the chair. Joel Simon ran Latin America. Bill Orm was the executive director. Knight Foundation had been a principal supporter of CPJ practically from inception. And I've been coming to this dinner since the early 90s. And each year, I leave feeling proud and inspired, as I, do to, as I will tonight. As Darren, meant, as, as Darren and I have been talking, um, I will soon step aside as president of Knight Foundation, but I'm delighted to tell you that my successor, Maribel Perez Wadsworth, is here tonight. Many of you know Maribel from her years at USA Today and Gannett and from her service on the Associated Press Board of Directors. Her desire to be here tonight, I hope, means significant continued support, and in any event, she is the one who's going to write the check to match all of your contributions. Welcome to Maribel. The world has changed so much since CPJ started, but our mission has remained the same. We use the tools of journalism to protect journalists. We work aggressively and stand up for the right of our colleagues around the world to report the news with, and safely and without fear of reprisals. As Ferdinand Ayete said earlier tonight, this work must not stop. A few examples from the dinners that I've attended are indelibly etched in my mind. In 1995, we presented the International Press Freedom Award to Veronica Guerin, an investigative reporter from Dublin's Sunday Independent. Her reporting of, on Ireland's criminal underworld prompted repeated attacks and death threats. But I remember walking with hope, walking out of this dinner with her, a woman full of determination, tenacity. The threats didn't stop, and they were real. And about a year later, stopped at a traffic light in her car in Dublin, she was shot dead for reporting the truth. At that same dinner in 1995, we honored Jose Ruben Zamora, whom you've heard about tonight, the great Guatemalan newsman. For decades, he had been, and he continues to be, a leading voice for independent journalism throughout the Americas. He was recently imprisoned, convicted, and his conviction was overturned, but he is still detained awaiting yet another trial on sham charges. And all the while, his newspaper has been shuttered. You heard from his son and greatest advocate, Jose Carlos Zamora, earlier this evening. This dinner has borne witness to government repression around the world and later online attacks, some crude, others finely orchestrated, all aimed at silencing journalists. One final memory from an annual dinner in 2014, we honored Mikhail Zigar, an independent television journalist in Russia. His station was forced out of business, but he continued reporting. When Russia invaded Ukraine, 
he went into exile with his family. The night of his CPJ award, I will never forget it, and this is in reference to Jody's comment about thinking of these as human beings, our friends, our colleagues who do this job. The night of his CPJ award, I went up to him at the after party and asked how he felt. And he said, I just want to feel as free in my country as I have felt in New York this week. There's good news. Today, Mikhail is the inaugural Press Freedom Fellow at the Craig Newmark School of Journalism at CUNY, and he is here tonight. Thank you. I spent my professional life first working in law and newspapers, and then for the last 18 years supporting free expression at night. But it was through CPJ that I first came to really appreciate what so many in this room do every day, find the truth and share it with the world, that that simple act is a privilege for which others are routinely beaten, jailed, and even killed around the world. But we in America take it for granted. We are lucky. I am lucky. And when I look at the list of Gwen Ifill honorees, I am humbled by their acceptance of the privilege of helping other journalists and by their enormous contribution to the full, accurate, contextual search for truth that must be the holy grail of journalism. I am deeply honored to now be counted in their company. And thank you very, very much. Thank you, Alberto, and congratulations. So, I come to my final task of the night. We're going to find out how much money we raised to enable CPJ to continue its vitally important work. I could say it, but to tell us, please welcome the new chair of the CPJ board, Jacob Weisberg. I want to thank Omar Jimenez, who was a wonderful MC this evening. It's not easy to keep a room full of 900 journalists quiet and paying attention. Um, and I want to congratulate our IPFA awardees. What an inspiring group. I always leave this dinner feeling proud of what I do and proud of what CPJ does. And I want to thank all of you because thanks to the people in this room, we've set a new record for this dinner. We have raised $2,771,000. All of that money is going to support CPJ's work, and you've seen what it is this evening. And lastly, I want to invite all of you to join us for a reception afterwards outside this room. Uh, the reception is sponsored by our friends at the Knights Foundation. One last good deed from Alberto. Thank you all so much. <laughs>